Hi, I'm Mary Lyons, the Wealth Woman. And I'm Eric Alexander with Acorn Grove. Welcome to the Wealth and Income Podcast. Today, I am super excited for the topic. And I feel like I say that every time because I'm generally excited about what we do and the fact that I get to talk about it all the time. Otherwise, but why would we talk about it? <laughs> all right. Today, though, is a special episode because... Our very own Eric Alexander has published and released his first book. Yeah, it's very exciting. It's very exciting. Yay. Yeah, so the name of the book is The Wealthy Entrepreneur Scorecard, uh, and the subtitle is Seven, T Seven Steps to Keeping More While Working Less. So Eric, I'm, I'm just going to start with what I think is probably a pretty basic question, but why did you write this book? Uh, it's the book I wish I had 20 years ago is basically kind of what I've, what I wanted to go have. And like, I had these moments, you know, 20 years ago, like I'm smarter than this, right? Like this should be really easy. Why is this so hard? Um, like when I'm thinking about money and finance and especially for that part of it, it, it's this weird paradox of it's this really important thing that we've got to get right. Because if we don't get it right, we all live under a bridge with a bunch of cats. Like there's, this horrible emotional picture of our brains of like, we've, we have failed at managing money. And yet for most of us, it is the most boring, most dry, most arcane subject that we can think of. And even if it was something that we could like, okay, we're going to knuckle down and do it once and then be done. Like, that's not how it works. You have to keep doing this really dry, boring thing. And so I wanted to have something that was like really simple, really short, lots of big pictures. If I could have put pop-ups in it, I would have done it. But like keeping it very, very, very basic so that we can get in, understand the concepts, understand big things, and then move on Like and, and have it in our life so it's not so heavy. I love that. And I think you said two things there that uh, really resonated with me. Um, the first is that even though most of us find money to be exciting, um, we don't find money management to be exciting. Right. It's like we like making money and we like right. having money, but the idea of like getting granular, looking at the budget, you know, understanding all the investment choices for most people is exactly the way you described it. It's dry and it's boring. And it's one of those things you have to do because you're an adult, but you maybe don't really want to. And I, I love that this book takes what you need to do and breaks it down into really easy steps that people can follow. Well, and, and I think that was the other component of it that, that drove the book was because we, we do this for a living. This is our job. This is, yeah. a, this is the world we live in. Right. And I think the industry is sort of divided into two components. The component of, let me show you how smart I am. I'm thinking of the advisors and some advisors. Sure. Are, let me show you how smart I am. And we've got this bait and I'm guilty of this. So I can yell at myself on this. Let me show you this beta number and this alpha number and, and this volatility, blah, blah, blah. Like, and we want to make it harder than it needs to be because, mm -hmm. well, we got to get paid for doing something. So if I can throw out a bunch of like weird words that you don't know, then I seem smarter. But then the whole other end of the industry is, no, none of it's that complex. All you got to do is put all your money in the S&P 500 index and be done. And it's like, it's not quite that easy. Maybe it's not quite that easy. So maybe there's a middle ground where it's not so arcane and sort of random and dry, but it's also a little bit more powerful than put all your money in your mattress and you'll be fine. Like trying right. to find Goldilocks in the middle. Well, and the second thing that you said that I think is really powerful has to do with your mindset 20 years ago. You're, you're a smart guy. So being in a position where before you got into this industry, especially, you're looking at things going, what am I supposed to do? I think that's right. actually a really common sentiment. I had a, a conversation yesterday um, with actually one of our advisors and a woman that we have hired to do some marketing type stuff for us. Oh, yeah. And um, she was asking some questions and it was interesting to listen to what one of our advisors said because she was talking about how, you know, she climbed the corporate ladder. She was um, an executive very early on in her late 20s, early 30s. Right. And she, you know, met with the financial advisor that was part of the 
401k. And then she found an outside financial advisor and she thought she was doing all the things. And then she came to work for our firm and between you and me and the education that we provided and the training, she was like, holy moly. Like I thought I had taken care of this and it turns out I hadn't taken care of anything at all. Yeah. Well, it's, it's the running comment. Like if I had a dollar for every time I heard this, I'd be richer than I am now. It's like, man, if I had only met you 20 years ago, it's like, I'm sorry. I could only get, I I couldn't get to you faster. Right. And that's, it's one of my favorite. It's a thing where it's like, okay, I've, I've earned my dollar today. Like I've done a good job today because it's that aha moment of like, oh, that's not that hard, but it's really powerful. It's kind of cool. Well, and I think the thing that's beautiful about what you've done is that instead of just regurgitating what everyone else says in the industry, you've applied critical thought to, okay, what are people saying? Why are they saying it? And how can we do things differently? Well, and that's the leg, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants, right? I'm thinking about your dad, Joe Kane, like my mentor in the business and some of the other people we've met along the way. And it's like, Dude, I just want to, I remember telling your dad this one time and I, and I tried to not to say it in a very creepy way, but like, Joe, I just want to swim around in your brain and see if I can like capture everything going on because I'm, I'm catching every third or fourth word that you say. And it's right. like, I can't listen to you long enough, fast enough to get it all in. And yeah. so, you know, That's- I'm trying to kind of spew some of that back out, whatever stuck, but it's, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants and all these people that came before us that have kind of helped shape some of that. Art, Art Sanger, Jason Sanger, you know, Rob, uh, Bob Castellone, Michael Finke, all yeah. those people. Yeah, just yeah. trying to go, okay, how do we make this simpler so that we don't need a PhD to understand, especially guys like Wade Fow and Finke, like. So technical. Oh gosh, yeah. Dense. Good information, hard for a lay person to get through. It's hard for all of us. <laughs> right. It's great. But we Let's need them, like, we, we need yeah. those guys with that that are going four miles deep on a subject. Right. So. Well, Eric, who is um who is this book for? You know, really, I, I think it's accessible for everybody because that's that was kind of the mission is to make it very, very, very accessible. But really the target for this book is really that small business owner, the solopreneur, the entrepreneur. And, and part of it is that we, given what we do, I kind of have a heart for those guys because I am one of those guys. Mm-hmm. And it reminded me when it, whenever we first started doing this years and years and years ago, I had this, vi- this vision of like, I want to be in control of my own destiny and I want to be in control of my own future. Um, but I think so many people that do that end up just buying a job. Yeah. And, but they buy a job without all the support and the structure that they had in their old job. And it's just them. It's just Bob. It's just Susie. And it's like, they've got to be the chief bottle washer and the chief marketing person and the salesperson. And like, they've got to do it all. And most of the time, you and I've seen this 4 million times, they got into business to make themselves wealthy, not to make their business wealthy. Right. And they're like, I don't have time to go figure out another thing. I got into this deal to be in my zone of genius. I don't want to also have to go learn about wealth building. And so they're like, forget it. All my money goes back into the business. I'm going to build this thing up really big and I'm going to sell it and ride off into the sunset. Well, when the, 80- the business is the plan, yeah. you know, and I, I think that's such an important thing because if I think even sort of back a couple generations in my family, uh, amazing entrepreneurs, like my dad's side of the family is almost exclusively entrepreneurs. I mean, he grew up in Mexico and most of his family is Mexican Catholic. And I think he has something like 50 first cousins. And that is not an exaggeration. That's the real actual number. Um, I think maybe two of his cousins have W2 jobs and the rest either are entrepreneurs or work in family businesses. So really just an insane quantity of entrepreneurs. And if you go back several generations, they had massive, massive revenue coming from like my, my grandfather and his brothers had a company that they built with massive revenue. Um, and you know, that was the goal is they were just going to ride that ship into the sunset. And unfortunately it involved government contracts in Mexico. And at some point when there was a change of presidency, the, uh, the contracts got pulled and overnight they lost everything. 
And then my grandfather moved back to the United States and built a second company and had a multi-million dollar offer, which would be big money if you start looking at inflation and what it would look like today. Right. But it was in the steel industry and he wasn't ready to sell when the offer came in. And then unfortunately, the steel industry in the United States collapsed. And so for the second time, this brilliant entrepreneur went through massive losses and, um, you know, he ended up working pretty much until he was physically uh, incapable of doing so. And so you look at that and I think what happens is a lot of times the type of people who become entrepreneurs are really hardworking, really dedicated uh, people that want to give something to the world, but they almost, uh, not everyone, but I find a lot of them don't always factor in the things that are outside of their control that could cause their business to implode because they are so capable of handling so many different situations. Yeah. So, well, that, and that idea to your point, right? That idea of the traditional advice of let's go stick all of our money in the market, all of our money in a bucket that we're just going to like a glass jar that we can see the money, but we can't touch it. Can't do anything with it is mm -hmm. completely anathema to their personality. And so yeah. Like, why would I do that? That makes no sense. I could make more doing X than I can in your stupid investment, right? And so mm -hmm. I, I, to me, a lot of what we talk about and you and I talk about on a daily basis and on the show is, okay, if that's, if that's where you're going to go get your growth, go get your growth there, but let's find a balance. Let's find a way so that we're not just hoping that that's going to go okay and that we've got all our eggs in that one spot. Yeah, it's, it's the beauty of economics-based planning because yeah. you're looking at building a strategy that has to work in every scenario. When things go well, it should be wonderful. But if things go the wrong direction, you still need a functional strategy. Yeah. So I, I love that. So there's, there's a couple things that I want to talk about from here. So in the book, you have six commandments, but then you also have uh, the seven steps to keeping more while working less. So the seven things that you need to track and do and all of that. Do you want to start with the six commandments or do you want to start with the seven things you're going to track? We'll start with the six commandments because they're pretty easy. And they're actually things that you and I talk about. Again, nothing in this book is stuff. Yeah, it looks like this is our day job, right? This is all we talk about at the water cooler, if that's a thing, you know, but like this is what we do all day. And so a lot of the commandments are stuff that we've been talking about on the show for, for a long time now, right? Income beats net worth is commandment one. And it's like trying to reiterate that net worth is stupid, not stupid, net worth is wonderful, but it's a poor judge of how you know you're winning. Um, potential beats enough, right? And that's, to me, that's a stewardship question, right? That's a mindset part of it. Um, and this is a conversation we've had four million times, especially on the real estate front, but core then explore, where yeah. we have a tendency to go for the gusto and then forget to build a foundation on the way up, which is really, really detrimental. Um, double duty dollars, right? Efficiency is everything. The more money you can get your job doing, more do jobs you can give your money, the better, right? Uh, diversify multiple directions, Safety, liquidity, acceleration is really commandment six. Like mm -hmm. we've got to build a foundation, hierarchy of wealth, right? We've got to build a foundation before we go do the, the cool, sexy stuff. Awesome. Yeah. If you had to pick a commandment, which one is your favorite? Oh, I, to not, me- Not the, to put you on the spot. You didn't know no, I was going to ask. No, no, no. Commit, to me, commandment one, income beats net worth is- like the central theme of everything that we do, like everything else that comes out of that, everything that else that we do comes from that idea that double duty dollar comes from that efficiency comes from it. Everything else supports that one idea that income mm -hmm. is net worth. And it, to me, it's the central component that makes us different than really most people that I've met in the industry is if I can solve the income problem and we can get away from trying to solve net worth, most everything else we do, the strategies and tools we deploy on the other end of it are the right ones. We're at least in the right direction. Right, right. And I, I think this is a, I think that point actually, if we could just stick on that for a second is so key because if you, if you think about how we are trained to focus on money 
it, any article you read that's talking about the wealthiest people, it's always a net worth conversation. Yeah. And if you have a billion dollars, you can afford to be terribly inefficient with how you're creating income because you have a surplus and you're going to, well, some people might not, but I would have a hard time actually spending the income that that would generate. Right. But I think the rest of us have to be so careful about the income creation part because yeah. you make totally different choices. And, and I've seen people who have focused on, okay, I'm going to build net worth and either the net worth fluctuates, maybe they took big losses like 2008, right? When they're getting right. ready to retire and that impacts their ability to take income or they've acquired assets that are just inefficient for income creation. Maybe the right. distribution rate is only 3% when they could be allocated differently and maybe have a 7% safe distribution rate. Right. And so if you have a higher distribution rate or you can take more income, you don't need as much money to maintain your lifestyle, which means you have more money to to spend and enjoy both before retirement and after. So I'm I'm dead on well, with you for that. And, it, and you made me think of something too on that. It, it reminds me of a, of a phrase that my boss I used to work for a large company here in Dallas. And my boss at the time says, you know, think about it. Think about how good of an employee we would be. If we didn't need the money. Mm -hmm. and whatever. And this was 20 years ago. But that yeah. one question has like stuck in my brain since that moment. Like, you know what? I would be amazing because I would be here because I want to be here. I would say the things that I'm thinking that I wouldn't say when I was worried about being fired for saying the thing. Right. right. You're, and you'd get the absolute best of me because I'm here because I want to be. And when I think about an entrepreneur, especially for, for the kind of the book that's it's who the book is written for, it's if I could exit the business tomorrow and get everything I need so that I'm. I'm fine. I have the exact lifestyle I want to have. I'm I'm good forever. Then the next day I come into work right after that moment, I'm coming into work because I want to, because I love the people, because I love the mission, because I love what we're doing. I'm not thinking if this doesn't go well, we're all homeless. I can well, and there's such a big difference, right? Between yeah. working because you want to and working because you have to. Oh, when you have to work, there's always that element of fear of what if this doesn't work out? What if I don't get a paycheck? You know, scarcity starts to creep in. And when you're working just because you want to, because the income piece is already taken care of, that's where creativity shows up. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And it's no so much more deliberate because you're not making short-term decisions for revenue. Then you're making long-term decisions for potential and growth and impact and purpose and all of those types of things. Yeah. And, and there's no resentment because when it's like right now, it's on 10 degrees outside or whatever it is. And my random kids are off school for yet another day. And it's like, I want to go hang out with my kids, but crap, I can't do that because I've got, I got a job. I have a day job. I have responsibilities. Right. And so it's not resentment at the job. It's just, there's a pull there. There's that divided on the side of it mentally. Right? Tension. There's a tension. That's a better way to say it. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So I actually want to talk about the title for just a second before we jump in the things to track, because, yeah. um, you and I spend a lot of time talking about the idea of scorecards. Yes. And I don't know that we've really talked about it a whole lot on the podcast, but it is something that we come back to a lot because I think we both at some point during our career, had a moment where we realized that we were making decisions based on someone else's scorecard. So, you know, maybe it's the traditional definition of success, big house, big cars, you know, right. whatever it may be, uh, big career or structuring it in a certain way for recognition as opposed to impact, any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Why, why did you pick that as the name? What, what drove that decision for you? Well, a, a lot of it was your your story, right? A lot of it was that your friend Jennifer and it, and it. I remember the question from my boss: Would it? What would we be if we didn't need the money, right? How how good of an employee? And I remember the question, and like it was yesterday, uh, your friend Jennifer asking that question. Seems like you're playing against someone else's scorecard, and it was like, oh my gosh, that's we're all doing it. Like sure. everything on Instagram is me playing or somebody else playing off somebody else's scorecard. Like it's. It, it is the society we live on, right? And so to me, it was part of it was that sort of subtle nod to that question, right? And in a way to go start talking about 
what's really, really important to you, which goes back to the income versus net worth. Like if I solve the income problem, then I get to live on my scorecard, not someone else's, right? Mm -hmm. And I think for so often, for so many of us, we don't know what it's like to play on our own scorecard. Like we can't even fathom what that really we means. We don't know what the scorecard is. Because we're so blinded by, I have to get up and do X so that I'm not homeless tomorrow, right? And we're not, we're not doing the thing. But from a logistical standpoint, right? To me, the my mission is to get the entrepreneur back in their zone of genius, not worrying about their money. Like that is right. like that's what I want to go do. And being that guy, right? Being I want to go have that for me too. But there's things that we got to go do. There's things that we have to track and manage because it's management. Like this thing doesn't manage sure. itself. And so the theory of the scorecard there was: how do I have something really, really short? So then in about five seconds, I can look through a list of seven questions and go, yep, 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 I'm on track, put it down and go do your day job, right? Mm -hmm. And have that be meaningful enough that it drives questions and decisions, but not so arcane that it's like, I have no even idea what that says. Like I, trying to find that Goldilocks where it's not so simple that it's dumb, but not so arcane that it's like, yeah, I'm not dealing with that. But something really, really simple, really, really concrete that you can track at a moment's notice. Okay, so let's talk about those things. There are seven steps uh, to yep. keeping more while working less. So let's start with number one. Yeah, and so this one I put in the safety category. Uh, I'm a big believer that uh, protection is there for unexpected events you can't afford, right? If I'm too dead to go to work, I need something else to make sure that my wife is okay, right? So yeah. in the safety category, the first two steps are really disability insurance and life insurance. Like, do I have enough money coming in? And again, income. Do I have enough income to pay for my expenses if I can't work and to pay for my expenses for my family if I'm dead? Like really, really simple, really morbid. And I love that this is where you started because it's so boring. It's so like, boring. I mean, I don't, I, you know what I'm saying though, right? Like it's uh, everybody wants to start with where am I going to put my money that I can go brag about what happens at a cocktail party and then <laughs> Frequently, it's those same people, unfortunately, that end up with the GoFundMe page because they oh. didn't take care of the basics. So I love oh. that you started here because it's not sexy. It's not exciting. Um, it is ridiculously practical is what and, it is. And really boring. Right. Yeah, that's what I said. I was trying not to be offensive. So I'm glad you didn't take it badly. But, well, you know. And there's no Facebook post that says, I just bought disability insurance. Bling. Like I've got. I don't know. Maybe that's our new marketing campaign. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What's my, I'm trying to channel my 11 year old. There's no Riz in that or whatever the, whatever the oh, phrase. Don't is. even go there. Please stay I, away from all of that. I like, I, I can't even with some of these questions uh, or some of those are words that I don't understand. Um, the, the second couple are really around sort of liquidity and, and to me, it's as boring as safety, but slightly cooler. Right. And so really okay. the, the next three are, what is my savings rate? Right. Because okay. Let's, before you give the other one, let's just stick on that one at a time. Yeah. So savings rate, what does that mean? Well, if I make $10 a month how much of that $10 am I putting aside to something else, to, to the future, to my savings? So if like, I'm putting away a dollar, my savings rate is 10%. Right. So and what percentage of my income? Now, I want to ask you a question because I do feel like this comes up a lot when we talk about savings yeah. rate. When you talk about savings rate, are you talking about gross yes. or net? Gross. And maybe we need to define those terms just in case someone is not financially minded, right? Right. Gross would be off the top. So if your salary is a hundred thousand dollars and you are saving 10%, even if it's after tax, right? Your 10% is $10,000. Whereas if you're looking at net, maybe you make a hundred thousand after you pay taxes, maybe it's only really 70,000. So if you're saving off of the net, then you'd be saving seven grand at the 10% savings rate. So you're talking about off the gross. Now this gets more complicated for entrepreneurs because frequently right. they don't have W-2s or even if they have a W-2, they might also have distributions, that sort of thing. So when you and talk about gross. savings, it's not gross revenue though, it's gross profit. Correct, to their household. 
Perfect. Because if the bills, the business is generating ten million dollars, but they take home two hundred k, because everything else gets put back into the business, I want 10, 10 20, 30 percent of the two hundred k. Right. So it's of of the gross amount before taxes that you take home. Correct. Okay. Right. And and the reason the rate is like number three and not number twelve is it's the thing that you can control the most. Like it doesn't. So wait. Hold on, because I'm lost. I thought number one was disability in life. Is that one and two? Yeah. One and two. Okay. So mm -hmm. disability life, that's one and two. And then the savings rate is number three. Correct. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. So that, and, and the reason I wanted to put it really, really high up is it is almost the only thing in your system that you have 100% control of, yeah. right? If, if I get... If I'm too sick to go to work, I might not have control over that. If I'm too dead to go to work, if the market's up or down, if whatever happens, those things I don't have control over. But savings rate, it's the lever that makes the most difference. And it's the thing I have the most control over. So I have another question for you. And this may end up with us having another face off or whatever, a grudge match, whatever we called it. But uh, <laughs> do you think Our the saving podcast, rate probably. should, yeah, should should it just be a flat number? Or is it dependent upon how old you are and where you're trying to go? Yes, the second. If you don't yeah. know what the number is, a good rule of thumb to start out at, in my mind is 20%, right? It, mm -hmm. it gets you started, you're up and running, you're doing the thing. And that's a really hard number to get to. Like that's really, well, really And 20% when you're in your 20s is going to end up, you know, you've got 45 years or whatever to save, depending right. on when you want to retire. But if you haven't saved anything and then you start saving 20% and you're 60 trying to retire in five years, then it's the wrong you're going to have totally different results, Correct. which is why I asked that question. No. And so that's, and that's why your savings rate, once you kind of get through all the rest of it, your savings rate is really a very custom number um, based on how much you've got, how old you are, when you want to get out and all the rest of the stuff. Um, and for most people, we kind of inch up to that, whatever that number is. So if you're 50 and you've done a really bad job saving, your number is probably not 20%. It's probably 30 or 40. But it's a hard thing to do to go from zero to 40 in a single leap. Right. Right. I remember having a conversation with Jason Sanger one time about this um, because he said something while he was on a stage somewhere. And I, afterwards, I was like, oh, my gosh, we have to go deeper into this. But it was specific to savings rate. And what he said was, you know, people ask him all the time, how much should I save and where should I put it? And his response was, I can't tell you how much until I know where it goes. And so I think having I thought that was a really fascinating way to look at things. And I think yeah. this is where, like starting with the basics. You got to have a goal. You got to have something that you're going towards. And then where you're putting it will tell you whether you need to save more than your target or less. And I think that's where like none of these things work in a vacuum. Correct. They're all interconnected. Yeah, well, just like disability and life insurance. If I make ten dollars a month, I don't need to. I don't need very much in disability insurance because I don't. Yeah. I'm not making much, right? But if I go from ten dollars a month to forty thousand a month, well, the next time you go through that iteration, and next time you update the plan, okay, well, we need to. We need more disability. But it the mission of the scorecard is to point out where you're solid and where you have deficiencies. Right. Right. Love it. Um, number four for me would be short-term savings. And I think this is always an opportunity for this one and strategic savings is a opportunity for a little bit of a grudge match. But to me, the short-term savings is the stuff that I need in my checking account to make the everyday work. It's right? liquidity in it's, its truest sense. Sure Immediately liquidity. accessible. I can ATM the cash out. Yeah. And, and when I, and you and I, I think we're on alignment on this one. Whenever I'm building models and, and plans for clients, I don't look at short-term savings as part of the retirement planning. It's just, right. hey, if the world ends tomorrow and I need tires because everything blew up, where do I get cash? Right. And and up until very recently, um, you know, if you had that kind of cash on hand, there was no rate of return on it. Now sure. you can at least get something if you have a high yield savings account. Right. And that's definitely worth looking at. I mean, I had a conversation with a, a client who had been putting a bunch of money into a cash account and I asked him where he was holding it and what the return was. And he said, oh, it's just in my checking account. 
Um, but it was like $200,000 or something like that, something, oh, wow. maybe not that much, but, and I was like, you realize this is at a, at a 4% savings clip, you'd have had like an extra eight grand this year off of that. And he was yeah. like, Whoa, I'm going to do that right when we get off of the phone. But, right. you know, sometimes we don't make the connection that we should be moving that somewhere that it can actually earn for us. Yeah. And I think that the fun part of that one is a conversation that you and I had about you and Mike and the um, the emotional conversations you guys have had about what that number looks like. When the, the money in the checking account gets to this number, everyone starts spending money like it's going out of style. And when the number is too low, we're all like, we're all going to be homeless tomorrow. Everyone can't do anything. Right. And so and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much money we have in other places. That's the account that we attach to. Right. It is kind of funny. Yeah. Um, All right. What's the the strategic savings is that next bucket, that next sort of big bucket where um, it's there for long term savings. Right. It's part of the retirement picture. But it's also yeah. there for uh, we, we've talked about this. Right. We're we're both in the process of building a rental property. Right. Mm -hmm. So to me, strategic savings would be how much do I need in that bucket so that if that that cabin, if that house isn't rented out for three or four months all at once, I'm not homeless or mm -hmm. we want to go do another cabin at some point. How do we build up savings so that we have some cash to go get that? Right. It's that so this, bucket. This sounds a little bit like a true emergency fund beyond just a month of expenses or, you know, being able to make sure that your account doesn't overdraft. This is like, where do you hold the capital that's for real emergencies and then also potential opportunities yep. and, and in a way that doesn't cause you to lose growth? Because yep. again, up until recently, you couldn't get much growth. Right. And so I look at that as sort of arm's length liquidity, right? It's a week to two weeks out um, and you can get some or most of it fairly quickly for an opportunity or for like the world to send in. So I actually um, had a conversation with compliance uh, and it changed the way I thought about something. And oh, I, this is me going off on a tangent that's sort of related, but kind of unrelated. And I'd love to get your take on it just because yeah. I have you captive right now. Um, but the conversation was about when you can use the word liquidity and when you need to use accessible cash. Oh. And I was like, what? Who, who's monitoring that? Like, how is that a different thing? And from a regulatory standpoint, liquidity is money that you can swipe an ATM card and get to, or that you can walk into a branch and walk out with cash. So okay. immediate kind of uh, access, that's okay. liquidity. Um, everything else I was told needs to be called accessible cash. And I thought this is a distinction without a difference and yep. started to get huffy about it. Glad. But you know, it actually like sparked some interesting uh conversation in my subconscious, right? My my little internal voices started talking and I started thinking about that. And this is really, I think the distinction between your short-term short savings and the strategic savings is right. that short-term savings is true liquidity. Yep. Everything else is accessible cash, but that has a bigger purpose if you yep. aren't using it at any given point in time. Right. Yeah. And that's exactly what it's there for. Right. It's that it, it it can play both ends. It can play safety and it can play offense is kind of how I'm right. thinking about it. Right. Yeah. I, I love that. And it, um, you know, I, I almost had this kind of like pushback because I have oppositional reflex, right? That's when compliance tells me you can't say that. I'm like, why not? Yes, I can. I want well, to. I can't. Right. Let me have my way. Uh, but I actually think that that distinction is really important because you can have access to your cash, but maybe it takes several days to do an electronic transfer, right. or maybe you have to trade out of some type of investment and liquidate it before it can make its way over. So it's not instantly liquid, but it is still accessible in a very short period of time. And I, I think what's brilliant about this, Eric, is that short-term savings piece of this, the liquidity piece of it yeah. is there. So you can get the money if you need it immediately for some reason, right. but everything else is maybe a day or two away. 
So you're still, yeah. you're still in a position where you can access that cash, even if you have to give it a different name. Well, and, and I go back to something that you've said 4 million times, but it's also one of my favorites is 90% of life is tricking yourself into making good choices. Mm. And to me, that short-term savings versus strategic is what I call the mic bucket. And I forget what the number is. I'm just going to make up a number. Like there's 10 grand on that account. Everyone feels like we're going to be okay. If there's 11, it's like, we should all go to Vegas. Like yeah. so we move that extra thousand out so that we don't see it. Like it's not in our right mm -hmm. in front of us and we don't spend it, but we know strategically that it's there, but it's, we've given it another job in our minds besides this money is free to go use. That's what you just said. We've given it another job in our minds. This is where I think semantics really matter because yeah. the way we label things shapes how we respond to it. Because if I just have money sitting in a checking account uh, or even a savings account, I can find something that I'd like to buy that might not be strategic, right? Like, oh, I would really like a new coffee table right now. I'm pretty sure if I had money in the account, I'd be like, eh, it's not gonna hurt if I spend you know, a thousand bucks on a new coffee table or whatever the price point is. Right. But when I have labeled the money strategic, I'm not going to spend it on a coffee table. <laughs> That's not strategic. There's nothing strategic about making that purchase. Right. So I think that that categorization is really key to making good long-term decisions because you have reframed what that money is for. And I, I, I feel like that needs to be underscored. I think that's really, really brilliant, Eric. Oh, well, that, well, I stole it from you. So it's good. I don't think you did, but I'll take credit if you want to give it to me. You know how I am. I'll take credit for whatever you want to assign. Uh, okay, what what is next? Yeah, the the, la the last piece is really what I call the growth piece, or and it really is kind of meat and potatoes of what we do, right? That idea of I know that I get the most income, not net worth. I get the most income when I have a balanced model, a balanced system of accumulation assets like market rate of return, equity, a business, whatever, whatever's growing on that side of it and distribution assets. And so that's, and, and when I'm doing that and I'm making those choices and the closer I get to that balance, the more income I get. So to me, question six is the key question of the whole seven is do I, what is my retirement income coverage? If I make a hundred K now, am I, am I on track that when I hang up my spurs, when I'm done, I have at least 100K or more coming in on the other end. Like, am I am I good, right? Am I on track to win? Um, and if I'm not, then it's a really quick calculus problem of going, okay, am I not saving enough or am I out of efficiency? So to me, number seven is right in line with number six of what is my savings efficiency? Am I saving in the right buckets and where it should go? Okay, elaborate on that. Yeah. How do I know? How would I know that? Yeah. So to me, and, and what we do, right? And we talk about insurance marrying up and coordinating up against investment assets or a business, right? And if we are too much investment assets, so all our money's in the market and we've got no insurance, then our retirement savings efficiency is, is out of whack. The, the seesaw, the mm -hmm. teeter totter, whatever we want to call it. We've got a big kid on one end and a little kid on the other Nobody end. On the other, yeah. And so we're out, we're out of whack. We've also met other people in our industry that are wolves of Wall Street, the market sucks, it's all organized gambling, whatever, whatever moniker we want to put with it. And I just want lots and lots of insurance. Well, that's just as that's just as bad when it comes to creating income. Because we've got a lot of distribution power, we've got a lot of safety, but we've got no gas. Mm -hmm. And so we we've just moved the heavy kid to the other side of the seesaw and it's we're still out of now whack. We have that. Right. Well, and I think this this piece right here is there's so much meat. I mean, honestly, this could be a whole series of podcasts just on this piece, because when you think about what happens, our the financial services industry is at war because you have a bunch of investment companies who want people to believe that the only place they should be putting their money is in the market. And then right. you have a bunch of insurance companies that want people to believe that the only place they should be putting their uh, their money is into insurance products, right? And I, I think that's perpetuated by a lot of the stuff that you see on social media right now. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the, I'm going to use their quotes, financial gurus uh, 
who are saying all kinds of things. And, and that's true on both sides of the spectrum. And it's almost like two kids fighting over the same toy. They both want the same thing and they will do anything they need to do to get it right within, you know, whatever legal framework there is. And so right. what happens is the insurance industry talks trash about investments and the investment industry talks trash about insurance instead of looking at it and going, okay, if we shared this, what could we actually do together? Right. Right. Well, and, and I, and, yeah, that's, that's, it's, it's crazy to me, but I think it comes from that sort of scarcity mentality. There's finite resources. I need as much as I possibly can, as opposed to approaching something collaboratively to figure out how, if we change the way we did things and maybe did find that balance that you're talking about, we could get right. to totally different outcomes. Well, and to me, it goes back to something fundamental is that at a at a baseline level, they're tool salespeople. They're selling tools and they want to figure out how to sell more tools. And what you and I have been trying to go do for years now is, no, it's strategy before tools. Like if you know what the strategy is, then there's probably multiple tools that can mm -hmm. go help you make that strategy work and to right. drive to the mindset we want, which is max income. I mean, that goes back to that commandment one of like being the the central commandment is I want income and I want it now, right? And to me where that question six is retirement income coverage, it's just a baseline of, am I on track to replace my income by the time I'm done? And if not, the savings efficiency and the savings rate are really key areas to go look at uh, as far as how do we turn the knobs to make that better, right? But it's right. a really quick, quick view. But to your point, there's a lot cranked into retirement income coverage that's beyond just uh, uh, a pure scorecard, so. Um, well, I think this is absolutely wonderful. It's an easy read, it's short, it's not It's not dense. I mean, honestly, it, it just flows while you're reading it. Um, Eric, where can they buy your book? Uh, anywhere you buy books, Amazon, uh, all the other cool places, you can get it on Kindle and uh, as a hard pack. It's, it's super thin. Very, very easy to read. So easy if you're read. looking for it, his book is called The Wealthy Entrepreneur Scorecard, Seven Steps to Keeping More While Working Less. Eric Alexander, <laughs> where can they find you if and they you, have questions about yeah. the book once they read it? Yeah. And you can find me at Economics with Eric, wherever you use social media. And what about you, Mary? If you're looking for me, you can find me at The Wealth Woman. We'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us. See ya. Specific financial concepts and advanced strategies are presented to you for educational purposes only. We cannot and do not guarantee their applicability to your individual circumstance. We encourage you to seek personalized advice from qualified professionals on all financial matters. Provided content is for overview and is not intended and should not be relied upon as individualized tax, legal, fiduciary, or investment advice. Neither Wealth Woman, Acorn Grove, or the Wealth and Income Podcast, nor their representatives provide tax or legal advice. For answers to specific questions and before making any decision, please consult a qualified attorney or tax advisors. All numeric examples and any individual shown are hypothetical and were used for explanatory purposes only. Actual results may vary. Investing involves risk, which includes potential loss of principal. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. Guarantees are subject to the claims paying ability of the issuing insurance company. Life insurance should be purchased by individuals that have a need to provide a death benefit to protect others with insurable interests in their lives against financial loss. Life insurance is not a retirement plan, investment, or savings account. Not affiliated with or endorsed by the Social Security Administration, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or any governmental agency. Insurance and investment products, not a deposit, not FDIC or NCUA insured, not insured by any federal government agency, not guaranteed by any bank or credit union, may lose value. Please visit the Wealth Woman website disclosure page for other important disclosures.